Oh, it's really hot. This video originally existed as an article, written for our website, booksandbow.com, by Akanksha Singh. I have since added to Akanksha's article with a few books of my own, so currently that article stands at 17 books that are recommended by Akanksha and myself, and I'm going to take the books that I actually know and have read from that list, which I think is seven or eight books, and talk about them here with you. But if you want to read a much longer list, written by a writer who actually knows a lot more Indian literature than I do, then please read Akanksha's article on our website. I'm also doing this video now because one of the books that I added to the article recently was this, which is the first book that I'm going to talk about and might fill up quite a lot of the video because it's fresh on my mind and it's really, really good. This is The Story of a Goat by Peramal Murugan. It was translated into English by N. Kalyan Rahman and was originally written in Tamil. Peramal Murugan is a really big deal in contemporary Indian literature. His last book, which I'm going to touch on in a second, <laughs> second, actually has quite an interesting story behind it and story that succeeded it and led to this. After the release of his previous book, Peramal Murugan almost quit writing altogether until this book kind of came into being in his mind and he put it to paper and here we are. And I'm really glad that he got it published because The Story of a Goat is absolutely beautiful. As I understand it, and I'm not an expert in Indian literature, Paramal Murugan really is an enormous name in literature in India. We do have some of his books available and I really urge you to go pick this up as well as his other book, which as I said, I will talk about in a second. <laughs> second. The Story of a Goat is a parable of sorts. At times it kind of reads like like a fable or a extended allegory or a conversation about modern day eco-politics and socio-politics. It feels at times like it is a story for children to give them a simple understanding of the cruelties of our world, but at the same time it's entirely a novel for adults. The story of a goat is the story of a goat. It begins with a man who lives in a very, very rural village who one day is on a hill and he meets this giant. As far as I know, after reading two of his novels, Paramal Murugan is famous for setting his books in the countryside. He likes to depict scenes and lives of very, very rural communities in India, which I think is a really, really valuable role for a writer to play. So our old man is on this hill and this giant comes towards him. And when he sees the giant, he is reminded of the Bakasura, which, as I understand it, is this man-eating thing from the Mahabharata. And the giant comes to him and he has this tiny kid, this little baby goat, and he's been trying to pawn it off, just, just give it to someone, and no one seems to want it. And the old man already has a few goats of his own and he just says, okay, fine, I'll take this, this little black female. And he takes her and she just will not survive. Like, she's, she's really struggling to grow, she's quite weak. And the old man and his wife, who are just called the old man and the old woman, are trying their best to raise this baby goat, while also trying to keep the other goats from bullying her, and to keep her alive as she struggles and gets ill. It's a really sweet, fable-type story. The story does explore bureaucracy a little bit, the government gets involved, and it does consider how our relationship with animals, with our community, with our pets, with our farms, and with our local governments and the corruption that is involved in this network of connections, how it all works, how it functions, and how it makes our lives more difficult, and kind of reminds us of the importance of love and emotional connection. It's a story a little bit about nature versus nurture, a little bit about nature versus the human world, about the, the unnaturalness of the Kafkaesque bureaucracy of life. There's a lot going on here, and I'm making it sound difficult and complicated, but that's the beauty of it. It's not. You will come to understand all of these themes and ideas, all of this political nature that is woven into the story just through the simpleness of its narrative. It is a very, very clear and elegant and stripped down kind of a tale. It's very much about two people trying their best to raise a baby goat. But there's also so much more to it than that. The giant and the strangeness of the story and the fact that it's kind of told more from the perspective of the goat than the people 
gives it this fairy tale, almost magical, fabulistic quality to it. I thought The Story of a Goat was an absolutely beautiful book. The cover art is really nice. It's published by Pushkin Press, who I absolutely love. So if you haven't read The Story of a Goat, if you haven't read much Indian literature at all, this is a really nice place to start. About two months ago, I made a video talking about books that were coming up that month, I think April. The Story of a Goat was on that, and I made the statement that I'd never read any Paramal Murugan before, and it turned out that that was completely wrong. I had read him before. I'd read One Part Woman, which was a book that was also published by Pushkin Press. And this this was a book that got a lot of attention, especially within India when it was published, and he received a lot of hate. Paramal Murugan was kind of shunned by certain subgroups of people for what he depicted in that book. I didn't know this at the time when I read it and reviewed it, and I do have a written review on our website, but I completely forgot that I'd already read that book because it had been two or three years. Anyway, point is, I read One Part Woman, and I really liked it. It's a very celebrated novel, it's also a very controversial novel, and that makes it really exciting in and of itself before you've heard anything about it. But I'll tell you a little about it. One Part Woman is a really sinister novel. Again, it is set in the rural Indian countryside in a small village, and it concerns a married couple called Ponna and Kali. They're really happy together. If I remember rightly, I think it's told from Ponna's point of view, and she really loves her husband and they get on and everything's great, except they can't conceive a child together. And this becomes a snowball that slowly grows over the course of the story. It reminded me of a play that I really loved when I was studying at university called Yerma, which is a Spanish play, I think? So if you've read or watched Yerma, you'll see a lot of connections between these two. If you haven't, you should go see or read Yerma, it's really good. Anyway, one part woman, as I said, it snowballs, and it's not the couple that are the issue, but the community surrounding them, their family and their friends. The couple can't conceive, and this becomes very well known in the village, and so people start to talk, people start to whisper, rumours start to spread, and everything grows, and suddenly the two of them are an item of obsession for all the people around them in their community. And this comes to a head at the halfway point with something called the Chariot Festival, which I will not talk about at all mostly because I don't really remember it. It's a book about paranoia, it's a book about superstition, it's a book about traditions and the harms that tradition can do when they come from a place of bigotry, misunderstanding, unhelpful superstitions and traditions that just don't do anyone any good and cause way, way more harm than anything else. And it's the couple that end up suffering as a result. Their lives were fine, but as soon as they couldn't conceive, this becomes a hot topic, and suddenly the way other people see them, it begins in a kind of accidental way. People who are sharing rumours and talking about them, they really don't know what they're doing, and then eventually they kind of do know what they're doing, and it becomes pretty sinister. I remember really, really enjoying the book, while having a few issues with, I think, the pacing, and there must be a reason that the second half of the book hasn't stuck in my head very well, but it's still worth a read, especially because it did cause a lot of controversy when it was published, which always makes books more exciting. The next book I want to talk about is probably my favourite Indian novel. It was written in English by Deepa Anapara, and you might have heard of it. It's called Gin Patrol on the Purple Line. I love this novel. It was longlisted for the Women's Prize back in 2020. It's gorgeous. It is exciting. It is a wonderful blend of different genres. And back in 2020, or 2019, can't remember, I was lucky enough to see Deepa Anapara give a talk at Foyle's Bookshop in London on Charing Cross Road, where she talked about the book and her influences and how it all started and her own personal background as a journalist. It was really exciting and I was so happy to get to see her give this talk. Jim Patrol on the Purple Line is one of those books of a type that you might have read before, where it is told from a child's perspective, and it leans pretty heavily on dramatic irony, where the audience knows a lot more than the protagonist, the characters. Usually dramatic irony is used with a few key plot points, a few twists and turns, and it can be done quite cleverly. Here, it's pretty much the entire novel, where the entire motivation for a young protagonist and his friends to do what they do in the story is something that we already pretty clearly understand as readers, as an audience. We know more than they do, mostly because they are children. The central premise is that you've got a group of very 
very impoverished children who live in Mumbai? Is it Mumbai? Might be New Delhi. I think it's Mumbai. And they live in ramshackle houses with tin roofs, very, very poor, and they're going to school and they're noticing that local children from their class, from their school, are going missing. And our protagonist is a boy who is obsessed with watching procedural police dramas and dreams of being a police officer. And he's got two friends and he takes his two friends on a journey around the city to figure out why these kids are going missing, who is taking them, and what's going on. And it blends superstition and big ideas and mystery and adventure with a very, very bleak reason behind what's happening that is much more obvious to us as readers from early on in the book than it is to our protagonists. And it was inspired by a genuine, massive political issue in India in the big cities where children are trafficked. It's really dark and bleak, while also not being bleak at all, because the perspective of adventure-loving children with big ideas and big imaginations kind of saves us from the bleak realities of what's really going on. It's a gorgeous book and I loved the way that our protagonists were characterized. I think that's my favorite thing about Gin Patrol. The way that our protagonists are depicted is just so damn charming. They are such lovable people with big energy and colorful personalities that really carry the story through. And it would be a much, much darker and bleaker story if it weren't for our protagonists. So it does this wonderful blend of children's adventure novels with something that's a very, very dark and upsetting political narrative that's going on in the background. Amazing stuff. Gin Patrol is a wonderful novel that doesn't get talked about enough. If you haven't read it, go pick it up. I love this novel. Another novel that is also really, really bleak and very, very political and discusses real world issues and is far more adult, I guess, than Gin Patrol. Although Gin Patrol is a very adult novel as well. Anyway, this is a novel that I also really, really adored and it was published by Tilted Axis Press, who are a publisher that I love and I've talked about repeatedly before. Please support Tilted Axis press, they are amazing. This novel is called The Yogini. It's written by Sangeeta Banjo Pajai, and it was translated into English by Arunava Sina. It's a short novel, and it has a gorgeous cover, as you can see here, and the yogini tells the story of a woman who is being stalked by something very terrifying and supernatural. It's not a horror novel, and I say supernatural, that's not entirely true, I guess. It's more metaphorical. Our protagonist is a newly married woman called Homi, who works as a TV journalist, and she is being stalked by a yogi. The novel begins in a very memorable way, kind of in media res, where she is on a train, and this man, this yogi, this haggard-looking middle-aged man is following her through the train, and she is frantically running from him, and eventually jumps off the train to escape him while it's moving. And then we flash back to when this all started. She's been married for a year, her marriage is difficult, and she is starting to have regrets, and I guess what you could call a midlife or quarter-life crisis. And this is when this yogi starts to stalk her. One night she sees him, and then she starts to see him everywhere. At times she's terrified, other times she kind of gets used to his presence, and it becomes very, very apparent very quickly that the yogi is a metaphor for fate. That's why I said before it's supernatural. It's not really supernatural, it's more creepy and metaphorical. The yogi is her fate, constantly chasing her, constantly forcing her to second-guess things or worry about things and to feel trapped. It's a story about a woman's responsibility, her duty, the social expectations for her to do certain things at certain times. Her job, she has a really respectable, commendable job. Her job gets explored. The role of her job, the responsibilities within her job, how her job factors into her romantic life, her marriage to her husband. It's about being trapped by fate. Fate meaning our societal expectations, our families and what they expect from us, our jobs and our roles within the system of modern 
capitalist society. It's a novel that is very much about Indian culture, but it's hugely relatable to anyone and everyone. I certainly related to it hugely. The Yogini is an amazing novel. I utterly adored it and I really recommend it. She does have two other novels out in translation through Tilted Axis Press as well, and I'm pretty sure I've read one of them. It's called Panty, and I think the other one's called Abandon. Yeah, I'm sure it's Panty and Abandon. And I'm sure I've read Panty, but I can't remember. So check these two out as well, but I cannot comment on them because I either haven't read them or I don't remember them at all. But either way, she has three novels with Tilted Axis Press in translation. Definitely read The Yogini, that is a fantastic novel. The novels I've already mentioned are the ones that I really, really want to promote heavily and are novels that I absolutely adore. I have two more, but honestly, these are two Indian novels that most people have read or at least heard about and know how great they are. I do recommend them hugely, but I'm not going to go into huge details detail because they're so famous. And the first one is The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy. Everyone knows this novel. It was written back in 1996-97 and it won the Booker Prize. It was her only novel until 20 years later when she wrote The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, which I haven't read yet and I really should. The God of Small Things is set in Kerala and it shifts between two time periods. I think it's the 60s and the 90s and it's about a boy-girl pair of twins and it's a book about casteism, the caste system in India, which is a continued source of inspiration for a lot of Indian fiction. You know about The God of Small Things. I'm not going to try and sell you on it. It's a prize-winning novel. It's a novel that is hugely cherished around the world go read it. The other novel I want to mention, and again, everyone's read this, everyone knows about this, is Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie is a very, very controversial figure in the world, uh, as, as a political figure, as a literary figure, as an artist. Salman Rushdie has done a lot for his literature, he's made a lot of sacrifices look into it, it's fascinating. This is another Indian novel that was written in English, and it was a novel that was years in the works. I actually recently listened to a podcast interview with Salman Rushdie by James O'Brien, and he interviewed Salman Rushdie and talked about how Midnight's Children came around. Fascinating podcast. If I can find it, I'll link to it in the description. Again, Midnight's Children is not a novel I need to sell you on. Most people like Salman Rushdie. Most people have read this. If you haven't, please read Midnight's Children, please read most of his books, they're pretty great. I haven't read Keyshot, his newest novel, and I've heard it's crap, so maybe don't read that one, but read Midnight's Children, read The God of Small Things, I don't need to sell you on these two books. I also have a habit of going into a lot of detail about my books and prattling on for too long, so maybe this is refreshing for you, I don't know. All right, that'll do it. As I said, there is an article linked in the description that is much, much longer than this video. It is 17 books. Some are short story collections, some are poetry, and I haven't read them all. The article was written by a different writer, Akanksha Singh, so please go check out that article now and you'll get a lot more books, but I only covered the ones that I've read and this was them. These are all great novels and read more Indian literature if you don't already. If you do, congratulations, brilliant, well done. I love you. Subscribe for books.